Hello and welcome to another episode of the Capitol Record. I am your host, David Bonson, and I am incredibly excited to bring back to Capitol Record Judy Shelton, one of the really special guests we had last year. Judy was one vote away from being named to the Federal Reserve Board of Governors. If it were not for the utterly bizarre reversal of support from Senator Mitt Romney, if it were not for Senator Grassley coming down with COVID, Judy Shelton would be on the Fed right now. Um, as after decades of experience as a distinguished economist and monetary policy intellectual, um, instead of serving now as a policymaker at the Fed governors, Judy continues to be a renowned intellect and thought leader, uh, frequently published in Wall Street Journal, covering these topics. Um, I've gotten to know Judy over the last year or so and really enjoyed our conversations on Capitol Record and believe she is simpatico with what I believe about the true essence of economics and the dangers of an overly interventionist central bank. So allow me to welcome back for the second time to the Capitol Record, our very special guest, Judy Shelton. So with that said, allow me to welcome back my very special guest joining us for the first time in 2022, but um, a year after having joined us last year, Judy Shelton. Judy, welcome back to Capitol Record. Great to be with you always, David. Thanks for inviting me. Well, Judy, a lot has happened since uh, we last had you on. It was one of my favorite episodes of our inaugural year of the podcast and one of our most downloaded episodes ever. I think a lot of people really appreciated what you had to say. But, you know, in this environment where there is so much talk around the Fed and monetary policy and where that does and doesn't interact with the inflation story and the recession story, um, I, I think it would just be wonderful to kind of hear from you and let listeners hear where you think we stand in the present cycle, what you think the Fed is currently doing right, and what you think uh, the Fed needs to be doing more of. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, in some ways, I hate to contribute to our preoccupation with the Federal Reserve. I really wish it were more of a passive player, and um, I think it's very unhealthy that it so dominates financial decision-making. And uh, I guess then my first criticism might be that um, the Federal Reserve has made itself too much of a player. And I think um, unintentionally, I suppose, but as an institution, it effectively incentivizes people to make money by playing off of money instead of using money to fund productive economic activity. So let me, let me jump in there real quick. Um, I write a weekly investment commentary called Dividend Cafe. It goes up every Friday at DividendCafe.com. And last Friday, I happened to write on this very subject, not just about the Fed's interventions, but specifically their most popular and well-known intervention of low interest rates that counterintuitively, it is not my belief that low interest rates stimulate growth. And very contrarianly, my view is that low interest rates contribute to low growth. And my argument is that the market rate being lower than the natural rate does exactly what you just said, that it incentivizes financial engineering and disincentivizes productive economic activity. Do you think I'm on to something there? Well, I certainly agree with you. And, um, and so I'm, I'm pleased that uh, great minds think alike, <laughs> if I can compliment both of us. But I do think you're a keen observer, and uh, it wouldn't be the first time that uh, your views and mine align on this subject. I think it, it, neither artificially high interest rates nor artificially low interest rates 
serve the needs of a free market economy. I think valid price signals are much more important and and conducive to productive activity than any scheme the Fed comes up with to to stimulate or restrain economic activity. So do you believe that um, the Fed's current position, and I'll put my cards on the table, I feel really bad for them, okay? I mean, <laughs> I, I, I agree with you that a lot of this is a creature of their own making. And I don't mean that about Chairman Powell per se, but I mean it about a, a, a succession of four or five Fed heads now that have had a very interventionist and, and, and very significant role in trying to neutralize uh, impacts of the business cycle. And I, and I would just use that term overly interventionist. Um, but I think that all good intentions notwithstanding, most of what they seem to have to deal with these days are the hangover effects of other things that they did, that there's this sort of constant whack-a-mole going on and that over time it becomes really distortive and, and, and really uh, uh, painful, I think, for economic growth. But I find myself a little bit on an island these days because I'm not convinced that one of the things they've done is create the big inflation we're dealing with right now. I don't think they've helped it. And I certainly think that low interest rates fed housing inflation. But I'm not convinced that the low inflation can explain the supply side challenges. The, excuse me, the low interest rates, let alone quantitative easing, can explain the supply side inflationary challenges we've had with energy, uh, with used car prices, with semiconductor imports, you know, some of those elements. Um, how does the Fed deal with the optics? that there's sort of this alleged Volcker-like moment where they need really high rates to deal with inflation. And yet at the same time, the fact that it may be a bit different and they stand to potentially do a lot of damage to the recession if they create artificially high rates, which is certainly not something a term we've talked about for a very long time in monetary policy. How do they unwind this mess? Well, uh, first, let me say, David, um, I do have enormous respect for people who are actually in the arena. Uh, it's much easier to be in a position uh, of an outside critic. And, and I'm the first to acknowledge that. And um, so uh, I, I'm, I'm not faulting the motives in any way of anyone on the Board of Governors and, and not of uh, Chair Jerome Powell. I do think that, that when I say not in the arena, in a way it is an arena and, and it's like a, a, a Greek play. And now the Fed has been forced to assume the position of, of the, the gallant hero who takes responsibility for this inflation when in fact he probably doesn't believe either that they're largely responsible Let's look at our, our poor Fed was trying so hard for years to push inflation up to 2%, and they weren't able to do it. No matter how low they went on interest rates, no matter how much they purchased government-provided uh, assets, they, um, they weren't able to do it and, and considered it quite a problem and a failing. And yet now they think by doing the opposite of what they were doing, suddenly that will fight the inflation that they never were able to relate to earlier. So it's kind of an, an odd situation where they have to, they have so often invoked their, their dual mandate with this solemn proclamation that they are responsible. Congress hasn't charged them with the objective of stable prices, and therefore they're going to uh, stay stand up there and fall on their sword by inflicting high interest rates, because that turns out to be the only tool they have, even if it kills demand and hurts the economy. I, I think this was almost entirely triggered by the fiscal stimulus, by putting purchasing power in the hands of people who are not generating output. So just by simple supply and demand, you were increasing prices, 
because you were providing that additional demand capability without at the same time increasing output and supply. So the Fed, yes, you could say they provided the kindling for all that, which they've been doing for years, but the Fed has been very successful at keeping almost all of that excess liquidity they created locked up. They corralled it in the form of excess reserves. They continue to keep it out of the real economy by paying interest on excess reserves and by engaging in reverse repos so that that cash has effectively been prevented from serving as part of the money supply that could have a role in financial intermediation because the Fed entices banks and, and money market funds to keep it out of um, financing productive investment. They keep it locked up. So, you know, it seems odd to me that the Fed now thinks it has to kill supply because when you provide financial capital, you are potentially giving money to individuals and firms who would hire people who would produce more output. And that could address the supply side of this inflation conundrum. But no, and as much as they're killing demand, they're killing that off too. I think inflation um, may get better in spite of what the Fed's doing. And I suppose they will take credit and say that they did the right thing. Um, this is nothing like a Volcker situation. Uh, there's no such thing as even normalizing, given that the Fed now has this role in keeping, I think we're up to about 5.7 trillion by my count. Um, if you look at the 3.3 the .3 in reserves and the 2.4 in overnight reverse repos, that's a lot of cash sitting, doing nothing at the Fed, sitting idle, but nevertheless collecting a cool interest rate for on a risk-free government guaranteed investment via the Federal Reserve. Well, con continuing with that thought, Judy, the, the um, insight there that you make, I think is very important that the Fed essentially used quantitative easing as a stimulative tool. And of course, this was not a pow move after COVID. It was a Bernanke move after the financial crisis that stayed active for many years through many trillions of dollars and through three different rounds of quantitative easing. Um, also, largely in the same context of what you just described, where they were primarily successful in leaving it in excess reserves, so that money did not end up circulating and adding to money supply at any inflationary level. The reverse repos were probably less of a factor then, but either way, um, it was similar. And then they began quantitative tightening, as we all know, in 2017 and into 2018, really without much disruption until it became accompanied by interest rate hikes and the pace of the tightening picked up um, around this time. Your name was starting to circulate much more heavily as a very legitimate uh, nominee potential onto the board of governors of the Fed. And then famously, uh, Chairman Powell and the Fed reversed course in late 18 and early 19 when credit markets sort of uh, revolted. And at some point, their tightening activities got rejected in markets and they went another direction. And then, of course, we know the COVID story a year later. The reason I bring that history up, Judy, is I wonder if you're surprised that so far the quantitative tightening at $47.5 billion per month has really been largely ignored by markets. The interest, the yields in the bond market are actually down quite significantly since they started, which marks the fourth time that a quantitative easing round ended and yields went down instead of up, perhaps counterintuitively for some. Um, do you think that when they double the level next month to the close to 100 billion, that that will create more of those 2018 conditions 
Were credit markets tightened? What is your expectation as the Fed adds this quantitative tightening um, element to their interest rate hikes? Well, as I uh, wrote for the Wall Street Journal back in December, I would much prefer that the Fed do reduce its portfolio as a way of reducing um, its footprint and as, to me, a more effective way of engaging with markets to increase interest rates, if that's the goal, um, that's much healthier than simply raising the rate that they pay off uh, banks and uh, money market funds to keep the cash idle. So I want to see them go old school on that and not just use runoff, but actually sell back securities. There are a number of studies uh, on the Federal Reserve's website explaining how this could all work and how they account for the bookkeeping of it through the SOMA, through the, um, um, the Fed system open market accounting approaches, which are not the same as generally accepted accounting practices in terms of recognizing market gains and losses. But nevertheless, I think that's a much better way for the Fed to go. Um, I was can happy. I, can I interrupt that they, there, Judy? Is the reason just simply that it accelerates the pace? It's both. I think that we don't know how much it would accelerate. It's certainly easier for the Fed to use administered rates, but it was easier for, to me, that's a, a Soviet type approach to banking. And uh, I think it's healthier in that markets would then be engaging with genuine increased supply of bonds. And for all we know, uh, it, could, it could be more measured because uh, to the extent that the United States is, is a safe haven, we sometimes see additional purchasing of treasury bonds. Maybe that would, by foreign purchasers, that could offset the fact that the Fed is increasing the supply. So we don't know exactly what the interest rate effect would be but I think at least you are in, engaging with market supply and demand versus trying to move the interest rate by diktat, which is what the Fed does now by relying primarily on those two administered rates on excess reserves and on reverse repurchase agreements. Um, so, so I think it's better, but I'm not convinced um, that the Fed is is actually carrying out the, the um, reduction of its portfolio as it had said it planned to do. Uh, I've been looking at the, the H41 weekly statements uh, every week. Uh, if you start June 1, which was when the Fed said they were going to do it, for those first two months, um, they were going to reduce uh, mortgage-backed securities by 17 and a half billion. So we would expect it to have gone down after two months of doing that, June and July, that by the, the release from August 3rd, that you would see a uh, 35 billion reduction in MBS. But in fact, there's a 10 billion increase. So it's very odd. Um, they're 45 billion behind schedule on that. You're right; they haven't gone to the accelerated, but just that initial approach. Um, the same, not quite as 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 flagrant as that, or as as um, puzzling as that, would be on Treasury securities. They should have been down by 60 billion in their Treasury holdings by now, at 30 billion a month initially. Um, but they're about $51 billion down, so they're also short on reducing treasuries. Now, some of it may be that they only said they only established caps. They didn't necessarily commit to meeting those caps. They just meant they wouldn't do it more than that. Perhaps the Fed would say, well, we leave it to the New York branch to decide the market timing of all that. Or it could be that there are adjustments related to especially TIPS bonds and how they're recording um, various aspects of, of those bonds. 
The bottom line, if you just look at the holdings of the Fed week to week, they are not meeting the, um, the metrics that they had stated as how they plan to reduce the portfolio. Well, I know that there's been quite a bit of talk about this online and um, even a real strong Fed critic like Daniel DiMartino Booth, who used to work with, with Dick Fisher at the Fed in Dallas, um, has, has written about how she believes the explanation as to why there has been quantitative tightening, even with some of these numbers confusing things a bit. Um, I, 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 think, I think you're right, though, that there are a number of potential things at play there. But, but I guess it, it still leaves us in a vulnerability um, a, as to whether or not the Fed, who seems right now committed to using two tools at once, rate hikes and balance sheet reduction um, at some level and in some composition, um, is, is to me likely to end up in another position like they were in 2018. And perhaps that's one of the advantages of accelerating the rate hikes the last couple 75 bips and, and, and wherever they get to a three handle on the Fed funds rate, that it will give them cover if the Fed tightening starts to um, damage credit markets that they can pause on the rate hikes and still allow balance sheet reduction. But do you think that we are stuck in a long-term cycle the quantitative easing will be a pretty immediate button to hit at any time of economic distress, and the quantitative tightening then will have to be um, the kind of response to those periods, rinse and repeat. Are we in a back and forth of easing and tightening with the Fed's balance sheet, or is it possible we can get to a place where we say using the balance sheet to manipulate the long end of the curve is more trouble than it's worth? Well, if you read Bernanke's latest book, it's clear that he considers quantitative easing a very effective tool. And instead of being an emergency after 2008, that now it's, it's conventional. And for me, the issue is the Fed quantitative engages in quantitative easing and piles on trillions in a matter of a year or two. And then the tightening is, is meant to be drawn out over a much longer time period. Part of that is the maturity of some of the securities, certainly the mortgage-backed securities. I think 97% of them don't, don't mature for over 10 years. And, uh, and if you're only gonna rely on runoff, then, then how are you gonna really cut that down? Um, so I'm afraid that what used to be considered an emergency, um, in, an emergency tool of the Fed has now become part of its conventional toolbox. And so I can easily imagine, especially based on the statements that, that the, the Fed makes, that they're ready to reverse tightening at, at whenever they think that might be called for. And it seems as though the justification becomes easier and easier each time for the Fed to just keep purchasing more and more assets. Um, we even, even if they don't call it that anymore, you mentioned what happened. I think you were building up to September of 2019. And um, my nomination had been first put forward in July of 2019. But I think we all remember that by um, September, uh, the Fed s suddenly saw a spike in the Fed funds rate of over 10% and then started uh, for, as it said, purely technical reasons, going back and purchasing um, treasury securities and MBS, but they didn't call it quantitative easing. They said it wasn't for monetary policy purposes. It was to relieve this sudden liquidity pressure. Well, I guess um, I, I guess that th at that time they they got away with it, right? I mean, they, they, the market seemed to accept the explanation, and even um, in the last several months of the ongoing quantitative easing 
Yeah, in the COVID round that was continuing to go in late 21 and early 22, they were doing heavy amounts of reverse repos that were offsetting. And I suspect that, that they can do this with Main Street all they want, because I don't think anyone has any idea what, what it means or what they're talking about. Um, but do you think that, it, that financial markets would continue to accept that? Or at some point, do you think that uh, the conventional use of the tool would become problematic? Well, I think the markets will always eat it up and like it, unfortunately. Um, I mean, I agree with you, and I talked to some great entrepreneurs who say I never made a decision to invest based on the interest rate. I made a decision to invest because I saw a great opportunity and the margins and potential for profit so overwhelmed um, the cost of borrowing funds, which was part of the calculation, but not the one that determined it. So um, I don't think there are enough people out there in the market who would say, yes, it's healthier to to have an interest rate that really reflects demand and supply of loanable capital, even though you said, and I agree with you, um, that you don't think low interest rates are necessarily good for growth or productive economic activity. I don't either. But I think markets love it because uh, markets like to engage with the Fed, engage with all the financial instruments that are basically speculating about future interest rates or about differentials between um, other major central banks around the world and our own and their impact on derivatives and on currencies and all the other opportunities to make money by playing with money instead of using money to fund productive activity. And, and that seems very intuitive that financial actors would like the opportunity to use engineering to make free money, right? Uh, X, if you borrow at X to invest in something yielding more than X, then tautologically, that, that's free money. But Japan it, it may not use the term quantitative easing, and Europe, ECB may not use it. But bond buying is bond buying, and bond buying with money that doesn't exist by a central bank is quantitative easing by any other name. And it doesn't seem that financial markets have eaten it up in Japan or Europe. Their equities, their real estate, their risk asset markets, their credit markets haven't been particularly exciting for quite some time. Is there not a diminishing return that we would face as well? Well... I guess I just don't hear people generally saying maybe we would be better off um, without having an interventionist Fed. I, I don't yet see a call for radical monetary reform that would insist that the Federal Reserve not be such a major player. The day that all the business, cable, financial news networks are not attuned to the press conference after an FOMC meeting to hang on every word that comes out of uh, the mouth of the Fed chair will be the day that I start to hope that there are people in the private sector who think that there is something to be said for a free market economy and something to be said for the importance of accurate price signaling to allocate financial capital to its optimal usage in terms of increasing economic output, opportunity, prosperity, all those good things that I think do flow out of democratic capitalism. But I think that the reporters, the whole uh, spectacle of, of various comments from officials associated with the Federal Reserve and culminating in the press conferences following the Open Market Committee meetings eight times a year uh, just proves to me that um, there's something about all that that 
uh, people in financial markets just can't get enough of. It's it's an entire industry to analyze those statements, to think about the future, and it becomes, I suppose, even even enjoyable to to argue about what the Fed is going to do next. And I, I, I just I don't know how to break this pattern of because people uh, people have bought into it. Well, I'll tell you what, what I think, and I'd love your opinion. I agree with you 100%. I think it's not only the deification of the Fed, you know, putting this very elevated position on what their role in the economy is, but there's the celebrityification of the Fed that I think Greenspan really helped initiate that um, there's this sort of understanding. A lot of people, anyone under the age in their mid-50s or younger, um, not just people in their 30s and 40s, but really people even at my age were raised with CNBC following around Greenspan's briefcase as if it were going to tell us something about technological innovation or something. I mean, it was a cartoonishly stupid development. And yet, I believe that it's Main Street and Wall Street and Congress that have all bought into the idea that the Fed has a supersized role in the economy. When COVID happened, I didn't see Chairman Powell pushing um, COVID task force people out of the way to get to the microphone. I saw people desperate to hear how many bonds he was going to buy and what kind of alphabet soup of emergency facilities they were going to set up. And I saw people getting in line to say why their money markets and their commercial credit and their high yield ETFs and their CMBS and, you know, so forth and so on. Everybody wanted a piece of whatever the Fed was going to do. And so I think that there is this vicious cycle at play. And the late Senator McCain, who, who I have a lot of uh, respect for for so many aspects, but I do remember his really unfortunate line, and I think he meant it as a joke to some degree, but when they asked you know, what he would do if, about um, monetary policy and if something <laughs> happened to Greenspan and he said he would hold him up and, and, and you know, leave him, you know, kind of made a joke about um, even just holding him up in the corner would be better, that we would need him so badly – Time Magazine famously, gosh, I'm just doing a whole blast from the past turn. I know, Judy, you remember all of this stuff. They put, I do. <laughs> they put uh, Summers and, and Rubin and, and Greenspan on the cover as the, what was it, the Holy Triumvirate or something? To save the world. To save the to world. To save the world. Yeah. See, no, I, no, think it, I think economics yeah. is human action. And I think that playing into this idea that the Fed has supersized powers implicitly says that human beings don't, that human actors don't, that entrepreneurs don't. And that's, my, that's what I think changes it, is when we re-educate the society that economics is human beings acting with their God-given reason to create and innovate, and that the central bank is a marginal actor at best in economic life. Well, I, I think you used the perfect word when you said deification. Because we do attribute some kind of omniscience yeah. to the Fed chairman. And then, uh, almost two years after Greenspan was out of office, he was then demonized that the man who had earlier been called the banker of the century was now the one who destroyed everything. And, and the point is... Um, we shouldn't assume anyone could could be omniscient. How could anyone know what should be the proper cost of capital? Greenspan wasn't, but nobody ever could be. And why this seems to nevertheless work for us, why we are drawn to making maestros and deities out of the, the person who heads the Federal Reserve could be something that I think Green, Greenspan and maybe even more, uh, Paul Volcker understood. It was back in the 90s, I believe it was the 50-year um, anniversary of Bretton Woods, so July 94. I did a long interview um, with, with Paul Volcker. We'd had a discussion for a publication, 
And at the end of it, we were talking and he said, you know, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. I adore Paul Volcker. Great, great guy. But he said, people think that those of us um, on the Fed board have some kind of secret plan that if everything goes to hell, we somehow know what it will take to put us back on course. And he said, here's what they don't know. We don't have anything. We don't, we don't know. We're reading the same things. We have some more data and we're pretty smart and we're working hard at this all the time, but we, we don't know either. And he said, so in truth, if people knew the truth, we'd really be in trouble. But he said, but the, the fact that they wrongly believe we have a plan that we can take off the shelf and put into effect and we know it will work. Ironically, that is what saves the system. It's that belief. He once uh, told someone who had just been made the head of the Bank of England who approached him for the first time and said, in a word, what is your secret? What makes a successful central banker he said, in a word, mystique. So there, there has to be this belief by humans that someone can throw the kitchen sink at everything, that they can deploy the airbags, as Powell did on March 15th, three days even before the scheduled FOMC meeting, that he suddenly convened the FOMC and, and give, said, give me everything we've ever considered since 2008, and let's do it all and more. I, um, I agree with you profoundly that human nature, no matter how much it appears to resist or resent this idea of omniscient actors pulling the levers of humanity, human nature sometimes seems to desperately want such a, a, a fantasy. And it's uh, my time as managing director at Morgan Stanley during the financial crisis deeply impacted how I view these things because it took me about 30 seconds to figure out that nobody had any idea what the hell was going on. <laughs> and that the people, it, sometimes in the midst of a very anti Wall Street sentiment, um, there was even at times, you know, a lot of conspiratorialism around it, but there was something soothing to people that, that believed that Goldman Sachs had this sinister master plan. And even though they were saying it as an insult about the kind of, you know, evil and bad intent of, of Goldman and whatnot, that it almost was comforting that for people to believe that even if it was nefarious actors, at least there were some actors that had the power to kind of keep the world turning, as opposed to what anyone who has spent any time off camera and off book with Ben Bernanke talking about those precious weeks of September and October 2008, uh, you get a very different impression of just from one meal to the next the chaos that they were dealing with and lack of real organized plan and, and strategy. And again, I don't say that as an insult. I say it as the way the world works. It was a crisis. And yet there seems to be comfort people derive from believing that folks have more power than they do. I would suggest, and, and I'd love your feedback on it, that one of the things Republicans or conservatives or sound money advocates need to do if we want to stop this fantasy is giving the central bank more implied power than they have. In other words, when we say they created all the inflation, aren't we implying they have the ability to fix all the inflation? You know, I hold Paul Volcker in as high regard as you do, and I think he was an outstanding central banker. But I even resist the idea that we sometimes hear that his vigorously hawkish approach of the early 80s was the sole factor in breaking the back of inflation. I'm not sure that his um, courageous acts without 
the supply side efforts on the fiscal element of, of marginal tax reduction and deregulation um, would have would have been adequate. I think necessary but not sufficient. And so I just wonder if maybe we're all a little guilty of giving them more power than they deserve. And the, and, and the great illustration of what I'm saying is Japan. The Bank of Japan doesn't even have to pretend that they're independent of Congress, right? They can actually literally act as a two-headed monster in central banking and in politicking. And yet they have been totally unable to deal with their inflation or deflation problem. They've been pushing on a string for, for decades. Um, I just wonder if the deification happens for those that are implicitly complimenting and those criticizing. Um, I, David, I think you are on to um, an extremely important point. This, this, is, this is critical. First, as far as what Volcker did, um, I mean, a third of the economy was almost sacrificed. I mean, it, it, it was terrible. Hmm. The, um, the, the outcome of, of what Volcker did was devastating to many, many people. It, it, he really had to destroy part of the economy to tame inflation, as they say. So I, I sometimes just cringe when I hear people saying, well, the Fed has to have a Volcker moment and, and, and do as much damage as necessary in order to bring down demand. Um, you know, I think that's so unfortunate. For me, it's the, it's the egocentric predicament for people uh, on the Fed Board of Governors or part of the uh, Federal Open Market Committee in that they think it's only about monetary policy. And th that is why, it, to me, when the Fed thought it was so important to re-examine the framework and came out with terrible timing with their new framework about waiting longer um, and asymmetrically tolerating higher inflation for the sake of, of higher employment, um, I thought they were muddling up the whole idea about the Phillips curve trade-off because I would say, look, there's nothing inflationary about having low unemployment. It's good to have people working. It's great to have people working. That's not inflationary. Amen. Um, and so, so um, you know, I, I, that's why I don't understand where the Fed is now exactly. As I say, I think inflation could come down in spite of what the Fed is doing. But um, uh, you, you, what, what were you bringing up that it just, oh, the importance of the, of the rest of the pro-growth agenda. Yeah. I mean, what we really want are the lower taxes. We want less regulation. We want, uh, all money has to do is provide a stable foundation that should be a relatively passive thing to do. Um, that's that's all they need to do. It's it's the better trade policies. It's the better energy policies in conjunction with encouraging entrepreneurial innovation by reducing that regulatory burden and not distracting people with with the high taxes and and um, compliance necessities. Let them be productive. And that is much more important than, than what the Fed is doing. It should be more important. And, and so that's where the focus should be. And that is what we had with the Reagan revolution. And I think that is what was so important during uh, the Trump administration. We had excellent growth and increased productivity and and reduced inequality when rates were going up just think we had the four four rate increases uh, on top of five earlier ones but just when Jay Powell first came in in uh, February 2018 only to have those reversed uh, three of them in 2019 but we had great employment and growth numbers in spite of what we can only call an erratic monetary approach, it, it's it's not it's not 
the monetary policy that should be determining economic growth. All it has to do is provide stable money. So I would like to de-emphasize the importance of monetary policy. At the same time, I would emphasize the importance of of business-friendly policies that encourage individuals to use their God-given talents in the way that you spoke so eloquently. Well, I think one of the interesting things about some of the people that President Trump had nominated into his cabinet was their um, philosophy of the very department that they were um, tasked to to run. Uh, Betsy DeVos um, was, did not believe that the federal government should be running the education department, and she came in to kind of reform and and diminish the relevance of that very department that, that she was tasked with. Uh, Governor Perry, the same thing. Now Secretary Perry, uh, energy. Um, I think there's other cabinet examples as well. But he also nominated you to the Federal Reserve Board. And you, for a string of circumstances that we talked about last time you're on the podcast by um, uh, the most just unfair and surreal of, of margins and bad luck and circumstances and potentially even really unfair interventions by, by some people that we won't get into now, it, you ended up not getting uh, to serve on the Fed. But I wonder, Judy, if you would be in that same classification um, had had your um, appointment nomination gone through, do would your role be to right size the role of the Fed, a less interventionist Fed, all the things you and I have been talking about the last hour, or do you believe that the very existence of the Fed is problematic? Well, I think both of those can be true. I I do think the existence of the Fed is problematic because even if you somehow delineated its responsibilities to basically staying in its box until those dire moments occurred when you needed a lender of last resort. Um, once you give it the powers that you're willing to provide it in order to carry out that function, it may be, it may be called upon under limited circumstances but it's then so overpowering, and as you say, you spend the next few years mopping up what it felt it had to do to deal with an emergency. And then even if the Fed was complicit in that emergency, as I think it surely was in the 2008 global financial crisis, Bernanke's conclusion was that every time the Fed is, well, he doesn't put it this way because he even went so far as to say he didn't think monetary policy was part of the 2008 meltdown, which I don't see how he can say that uh, with a straight face. But be that as it may, he then thinks that the additional powers that the Fed exercised um, should appropriately be then looked upon as um, something they could always use in the future. And he doesn't call for, for going back or in any way um, putting those tools back in any kind of box. He wants to expand those tools and those powers and to come up with more. Um, so, so the Fed seems to reward itself with additional powers um, in response to episodes that I think um, should, should frighten us about the impact of our central bank in the performance of the economy. Um, if the whole justification for giving a central bank the power to artificially stimulate or constrain economic activity is meant to cause fewer financial episodes of instability or to, to maximize economic outcomes, I think that uh, an objective analysis would say they've failed that. I mean, all it takes is a 2008 or what were, or, or 9% inflation to say that uh, the Fed has, has exacerbated the problems that we would have had in the absence of a governing authority that allocated capital and uh, and tried to um, artificially um, adjust the interest rate. 
I, I think that we, I, I would certainly suggest that the distortions have, have hurt productive economic activity. It, it won't always show up in GDP numbers because even the money you make from, if you just speculated all day long, um, in even say the, the, what is it? 8 trillion foreign exchange market. And you only made your money by gaming differential interest rates of the ECB and the and the Fed, but you generated you know a healthy half half a million income annually. That's still going to show up as uh, national income and look like we're growing. But I would say the financialization of the GDP numbers yeah. um, is is uh, covering up a real loss in productive potential output. Well, that I, I agree entirely. I, I wish that we had you and, and people like you at the Fed to make the same case. My, by the way, that issue about the existence of the Fed, my, one, of, one of my problems is that as the fever pitch of anti-Fedism picked up, the Fed's powers and role in society picked up inversely. And I think a lot of it was that there was so much kind of fever swamp criticism of the Fed, really crazy conspiracy theories and so forth, that it almost kind of empowered and emboldened them, where your very basic critique is sufficient enough that, that they simply haven't done what they were tasked to do over the last 100 years. I, I tell people all the time that um, I'm not a Rothbardian about this. I, I, in theory, and those two words are really important, in theory, believe in the role of a central bank to serve as a lender of last resort. But you know, that lender of last resort and Bajit's famous exhortation about lending at very high rates with very good collateral, um, that came 60 years, uh, well, I mean, it was 100 years from when he said it, but. Uh, from the time we instituted a Fed to the time of the dual mandate, um, decades had gone by. And then from the time of the dual mandate to the time of the financial crisis and COVID and all the alphabet soup of QE and, and TALF and TAR, you know, all the things that, would, that have happened, another 40, 50 years went by. I want to separate my criticism of what the Fed has done from the theory of a lender of last resort. I, I, I think the notion of lending at high rates with very good collateral could be very important and useful, but be that as it may, it isn't what we have now. We have a probably three or four mandate Fed in practicality these days, and, and it has done exactly what you've said about financialization, and so, I, I just wish, Judy, that you were there. That's what I wish. I, I think even if you weren't chair, even if you were one of many bankers, or excuse me, governors, I think it would be so helpful to have that diversity of thought and philosophy and allow an intellectual argument to happen that could potentially reformulate what we think about monetary policy in the decades ahead. Well, th thank you, David. That that means a great deal to me, uh, coming from you especially. I I appreciate it. Um, I, what I would have tried to do, and I realize in the highly choreographed uh, uh, setting of Federal Reserve meetings, it's it's hard to go off script. But I would have endeavored to have a discussion about whether it would be possible to, to have a, a plan to end the program over a reasonable period. I could go two years, but I would suggest we should consider phasing out the practice of paying interest on reserves, not only because it was an emergency, um, it, it was an emergency tool provided to the Fed in 2008. It was meant to allow the Fed to tackle what they were afraid could its policies that could lead to hyperinflation. Well, Bernanke famously said, uh, we can raise interest rates in 15 minutes. Yes, it's easy 
if you do it through the administered rates of paying interest on excess reserves. But I, I there's a paper um, the Fed put out, its research department, in 2015 about uh, what would happen on the whole relationship of the Fed paying remittances to Treasury if they stayed at what they considered at that point at this massive level of portfolio portfolio holdings that was 2.3 trillion. Well, think of that now at nine. And I, even in that paper, they talked about the political economy issues, meaning politics, meaning politics, that the Fed will look bad if it turns out it has to it can't cover its own expenses because what it derives from the income it receives as interest on its own portfolio holdings is not enough to cover what it has to pay on excess reserves and reverse repurchases. And then it not only can't pay remittances to Treasury, but it will have to get advances from Treasury. Now, I think the Fed is concerned about this. That was my last Wall Street Journal piece. Um, they are, if they get to three and a half by the end of this year, and even really starting even after this last um, increase of 75 basis points, they're right on the cusp of not being able to cover their monthly operating costs. Now, I've heard one time a member of Congress, French Hill, on Financial Services Committee, did ask, did ask Powell near the end of his um, uh, semi-annual testimony, "What about this situation?" And Powell, to me, seemed um, somewhat um, anxious, even cranky, and immediately blurted out, "Well, we've given Treasury over over a, a trillion." <laughs> I thought, now that begs the point. I think he was trying to suggest, so if we now have to uh, get an advance on, on future remittances, then, then why should Congress be complaining? But it's really much worse than that. It's worse than that. The Treasury and, and the Fed will be quick to call it a deferred asset when Treasury has to advance funds to the Fed to pay off the banks and hedge funds um, and cover its own operating expenses. But- Calling it a deferred asset is really a bookkeeping issue because the federal government, uh, Treasury, has been only too happy to claim those remittances every year from the Fed, and they've been averaging over a hundred billion for the last few years as revenues to the budget. So if that's now going to be negative, then that's expenditures from the budget. That's coming from taxpayers. And yes, it's a political issue and it looks bad, but I'm happy to highlight it because as I keep saying, I hate the practice of paying interest on excess reserves. And if it drives the Fed into this embarrassing financial situation, especially when it comes out that a third of the interest on reserves is being paid by the Fed using now money from the Treasury to foreign-owned banks at the same time that those banks love to park the cash there because their own central banks aren't fighting inflation with higher interest rates. They're letting us do that. And if that causes them problems, they know that they have a currency swap window with the Fed that will help them buy cheaper dollars to supply their own borrowers. So I just think the whole thing is not a, a healthy situation between the Fed and the Treasury. And I think it's worth calling attention to. Well, I, I agree completely. And I think actually having a real life banker like French Hill in the Congress and on that committee is probably a very inconvenient thing for for the Fed in those testimonies. They're not used to quite that uh, that competence and, and, and vocabulary in these matters. But, but what you bring up is a great practical example of how the an unhealthy practice uh, such as paying interest on excess reserves, is in fact um, able to be brought down by shining a light on with more transparency on what's really going on. And I think that there are legitimate criticisms like that that can be highlighted that don't require us to become, you know, 
fever swamp conspiracist, we can we really focus on on the black and white truth of what you've just said to make our point and and seek out over time incrementally a less interventionist fed. Judy, I've I've kept you too long. I can I, I appreciate your time so much. I appreciate your insights, your ongoing writings in, in the journal, and I just really hope you'll uh, consider coming back to Capitol Record again because I think the audience learns a lot from all you have to say here about monetary policy and a really um, true and proper view of economic growth. Well, thank you. That's very gracious of you. And and I must say it's, it's intellectually gratifying to be able to um, express these views and, and feel that um, uh, to a great extent, we, we are aligned and, uh, and, and look, I'm not a professional rabble rouser. I don't think the motives of anyone at the fed, um, are anything less than, than noble and publicly minded. But I, I do think that, um, institutions have a way of, of moving away from what was originally intended and with additional power comes a potential for abuse. And um, I think it's gotten to the point where it is so much at odds with what I think our society should value in terms of economic opportunity, that money should work the same for everyone, that productive endeavor should be financed through market mechanisms, that 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 fuels my frustration. I wouldn't call it anger, but frustration with the Fed. Nevertheless, I would have tried to be constructive and collegial in the recommendations I would have pursued had I had that opportunity. Well, I have no doubt that's true. And I look forward to ongoing conversation. And, and thank you so much, Judy, for your time and contribution to the subject. Thanks for joining us at Capitol Record. My pleasure. Thanks again, David. OK, I'm proud of myself because I was going to keep Judy for another four hours. And I was able to cut it off after uh, uh, an hour or so. I am telling you that Judy has so much to offer on this subject. There are so many profound insights, cogent, clear, articulate expression, philosophically grounded, um, and really important to the cause of a free society that believes overly interventionist central banking is doing more damage than good, impeding the cause of economic growth, impeding free exchange and, and, and practice in a market economy. And this term, this theme about excessive financialization, repressing organic, healthy, natural economic growth, it's the passion of Judy's um, academic and professional life. And it's a passion of ours here at Capitol Record. I really hope you enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. Share it far and wide. Um, reach out with any questions. Read DividendCafe.com each and every week. But keep listening to us here at Capitol Record. We want to bring you more guests like Judy Shelton uh, doing the right thing, spreading the right truth as we pursue our aim of a free and virtuous society. Thank you for listening to the Capitol Record.